morning. I hope you are full of energy after this uh, coffee break and uh, looking forward to a really exciting panel. It's an honor to be here. Thanks for the organizers to uh, invite for, for inviting me. Uh, we had to reshuffle this uh, uh, discussion a bit uh, because um, Mr. Koch, due to some uh, time constraints, will present at the very end. So we will start with uh, Professor Riley, yep. we got in medias res, uh, followed by Mr. Micek from OMV and Mr. Shimkos from the Energy Community Secretariat. Uh, I will have to look on the watch. That's my task, 15 minutes. 15 minutes, okay. 15, not 50. 15. 15. 15. 15. 15. 15. 15. 15. 15. <laughs> and uh, just a few words before we get started. Uh, very briefly, uh, the Vienna Energy Forum is a good example of cooperation between academia and energy policy and law practitioners. And Austria very much uh, welcomes this process. Um, I think Vienna is a good city to connect. Um, this conference is a success with so many registered participants. I hope next year even more. Uh, and uh, well, now let's turn to the to the three topics that are on the menu. Uh, we are looking forward to an exciting debate on the future of gas, diversification, pipelines between economics, law, and diplomacy. Professor Riley, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Right. Well, it's very nice to be in Vienna and at the energy community. And uh, as I am British, I suppose I have to give you an, a Brexit observation. And my Brexit observation is that um, if the vote, God help us, goes the wrong way on June the 23rd, on June the 24th, you may well be receiving a British application for membership of the energy community. <laughs> Let's hope not. Now, I'm going to talk about Nord Stream, and, I, and obviously, if anyone has uh, seen the YouTube of my uh, presentation in the European Parliament, you may have a very good idea of what I'm going to say, and it isn't positive. But I actually want to be, uh, I want to be, I want to give a, a, a positive element to this. Uh, and I'm going to talk about Nord Stream and go through some of the legal issues. But I also want to suggest uh, another approach, because I think there is a real issue here of continually the Russians coming up with new pipeline projects and missing the plot. And my argument is, is that there is a deal to be done between Europe and uh, the uh, Russian Federation in, in which uh, we do a grand deal, a grand bargain between access to the single market and a, a large gas market and um, w uh, the provision of uh, large amounts of gas on a high volume, low price model. And that is where I think the future is. And the future isn't in building, attempting to build more pipelines. So let me just start with some of this. I think part of what's happened, I mean, you know, the story of Nord Stream 2, that, uh, that in June of last year in St. Petersburg, Nord Stream 2 was announced. And then we have, um, the uh, shareholders' agreement signed very speedily in September in Vladivostok. I think Gazprom and its commercial partners have fundally, fundamentally misconstrued the uh, legal and political context in which they're operating. Now, it is not 2006. The third energy package is now in force. We don't merely have the third energy package fully in force. We also have a decisional practice. We have case law, which makes it, as I will explain, very difficult to push Nord Stream 2 through. We also have other changes. I mean, you could see this a little in the European Parliament with the ferocity of the green opposition. The renewables and climate change agenda didn't really exist in 2006. It does exist now, and there is substantial interest to sustain it. And then the other thing you cannot ignore, and I know that uh, Reinhardt will talk about it not being a business project, 
But you cannot ignore the fact that Russia has invaded another European state. It has annexed part of another European state and is currently in military conflict in part of, a, of that same European state. And, and that changes the context. That changes the context substantially. And I think you have to look at what is really going on and look at that context and ask, is it possible to get this deal through? And I think you could see the difficulty in the European Parliament hearing. I was quite, uh, last week, I was quite surprised by the scale of the opposition, because you didn't just have the usual suspects, the Poles and the Bolts. You had, uh, as I say, a very large green lobby who saw this, the phrase which was used is that Nord Stream 2 is a super keystone which should be opposed, a fossil fuel pipeline which should not be built. You had the economic liberals who saw this as an anti-single market project. You had Christian Democrats who were concerned about Russia. So this is a huge political constituency in the parliament. You've also got, uh, almost without exception, all the NGOs who have turned up uh, at the hearing were opposed. Uh, you have also got more than half the member states opposed. I mean, one of the points they say about this is that when Nord Stream 1 was going through, all the Central and Eastern European and Baltic states had just joined. They were still feeling their way. Now they're much more active and know how to make the EU work. And then you've got the opposition of the United States as well. This is no small, this is no small barrier to bringing Nord Stream into operation. And I think the other element of this, which uh, as lawyers we are probably more interested in, is the legal issues. And the legal issues are very difficult. I mean, if you just go, I'm not, there, is, there, are, there are a number of other issues, but let me just focus on three core ones. And it seems to me, first of all, is the third, third party access obligation. Uh, how on earth can you fit Nord Stream 2 with the TPA obligations of the gas directive? And the only entry point is Russia, and Gazprom has an export monopoly. Uh, then there's ownership and bundling. Uh, any new infrastructure has to be subject to, the, uh, uh, to ownership and bundling. All of the, uh, all of the um, members of the um, cor uh, consortium are gas suppliers. Uh, you have a very serious ownership and bundling problem. The third element is Article 11 certification. How do you get around Article 11 certification? And the, the issue here is uh, you've got to look, of course, at the supply security of the member states, which presumably will be Germany, where it lands, and of the European Union. Now, Nord Stream 2, uh, for, because where it is a non-EU-owned pipeline. Nord Stream 2 is located in Switzerland. Uh, the Gazprom has 50% of the shares. If you take the, the merger control test for control, uh, it's clearly a non-EU-owned pipeline. And the difficulty with the supply security issue is that, uh, first of all, the core supply security issue for Central and Eastern Europe is that Nord Stream 2 will remove throughput security. That in essentially, at the moment, gas flowing from and transit from Ukraine through Central and Eastern European states <coughs> provides those Central and Eastern European states with a degree of security because you can't cut off the Central and Eastern European sta states without cutting off uh, supplies in Western Europe. Now, part of the German response to this is to say, and this is what Sigmar Gabriel was saying a few weeks ago in Poland, he was saying, well, we can do reverse flow uh, for, from Germany to uh, Poland as we have done for Ukraine. And the Polish answer to this, not unreasonably, was, well, we've talked to the Ukrainians, and Alexei Miller was trying to, in 2014 and 2015, was trying to reduce the amount of gas going to uh, the European Union to stop reverse flows to Ukraine. So that isn't a very uh, safe and secure response from the point of view of the Central and Eastern European states. So I think those issues of third-party access, ownership and bundling, and Article 11 certification are very crunchy, very real, and very difficult. Now, you can argue Article 36 exemption. Again, there are some issues about can it only, Article 36 only apply between two member states, but let's assume we take a purposive interpretation of the gas directive, and Article 36 can, in principle, apply. You then have two problems. One is that, the, that it's not in the criteria of Article 36 additional supply. It is diversionary supply. It's merely shifting the gas from Ukraine to, uh, through the Baltic Sea. So it's not additional supply. 
Now, I've noticed that since I started making this point, some of the Nord Stream uh, uh, officials have started changing their argument and saying there will be additional supply. But I remember this argument uh, uh, last time round with Nord Stream 1 when we were promised additional supply. And what actually happened was that the amount of gas coming through Ukraine dropped and the gas went through Nord Stream 1 instead. So I think on the basis of previous practice, that is what will happen again. And equally, there is a competition issue here, which is another criteria of Article 36. Just think of what this would mean. You're increasing Nord Stream 1 would increase the uh, presence of already a dominant market player on the German market. It would give Gazprom the capacity to choose between a series of pipelines which way to go, who to supply, uh, and price and territorial discrimination will be much easier to achieve. How is that pro-competitive? The other issue is, and I think this is one of the major reasons for Nord Stream 2, is to get into the market and to be able to vastly supply Western Europe before uh, LNG comes into the European market at scale. None of these are pro-competitive reasons to, uh, to, to give uh, Article 36 exemption. Now, part of the argument which is used uh, to respond to all this is say somehow EU law does not apply. So let me run through you some of the some of these arguments are more absurd than others. But let me just run through them. One of them is pipelines in the sea have legal immunity. Now I have scoured the Ake communautaire and I can find no legal principle which says if you stick something in the sea EU law does not apply. Uh, this is not part of the Ake communautaire. And uh, the difficulty with this is that and this is you know, I've seen this in, in, written by fairly esteemed uh, uh, energy analysts. I have seen uh, papers which tell me that uh, it is an open question whether EU law applies in the territorial sea of a member state. It is not an open question. It is law, you know, this is law 101. It says, you ask a student in the first year, um, you know, what is the field of application of the law of England and Wales, or indeed the law of Germany? They say, you say, the answer is, to the physical territory, the land of the state, and to the territorial sea, sea out to 12 miles. And given you have got 100 kilometers or so of Nord Stream running through the territorial waters of Denmark and Germany, the EU has jurisdiction. Now, that, that, is not, that is not an arguable point. Uh, exclusive economic zone, we have very good case law in the Habitats Directive, case 6-04, Commission of the UK, where it was pretty clear that the court's view was that, um, where possible, the EU law should apply in exclusive economic zone. There is an additional argument in the case of Nord Stream 2, that if you take the view that putting it in the exclusive economic zone is an attempt to escape the application of EU law, the usual Court of Justice's view of any such avoidance strategies is to uh, flatten them by ensuring the full application of EU law. So I think that's one difficult issue to take forward as a way round. The next one is the Article 34 upstream pipeline argument. Again, the difficulty with this is yes, you, you don't have to apply uh, the full third energy package to upstream pipelines, but it's not an upstream pipeline. It's just the pipeline, Nord Stream, does not connect a fossil fuel production facility um, with a, 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 to another consumer or party. It is a connecting pipeline between the Russian transmission system and the European transmission system. Uh, and I don't, again, you can't see how you can get around that. Plus, in addition to which, the Commission ruled in South Stream, um, internal rule, but still, uh, I actually suggested to the journalists in the room in the Parliament, they might like to make some FOI requests on this. But uh, in, in South Stream, the Commission ruled that clearly um, Article 34 could not apply, and they took a similar view in relation to Nord Stream 1. So I sincerely don't see how they can make a different decision on this case, and Article 34 cannot simply bear the weight of the uh, proposal that Nord Stream makes for its application in that case. Then we have, um, again, this is, I think, it's fairly absurd, is that it's somehow unfair and discriminatory to apply the third energy package to uh, Nord Stream 2 when it wasn't applied to older pipelines. And what do they want us to do? We could immediately on full uh, uh, on the date of implementation in March 2011 we could have required full retroactive application to all existing pipelines 
But we didn't do that on the basis of legitimate expectations, and we will see over time full adaptation to most of the pipelines, uh, the older pipelines. But clearly, if it's a new pipeline, the new law will apply to new pipelines. Again, this is not, you know, in terms of legal principle, this is not a diff difficult issue to raise. And then you've got um, the YAML pipeline, which is a, a, an example of a, a, of a pipeline where the third energy package has been applied to a pipeline which is an export pipeline, bringing gas from Russia via Belarus and into the EU. And the Polish end of the YAML pipeline is being subject to full third energy package certification. Now, if it is, given that is the case, how can you not apply Nord Stream 2? Now, Mr. Lissick, who is the, um, the, um, the PR uh, executive for Nord Stream in the Parliament, he originally used the Article 34 argument, but then I think got a little confused. And uh, when I raised the YAML issue, he said, ah, the distinction between YAML and Nord Stream 2 is that YAML enters the single market, but Nord Stream 2 does not. Now, frankly, I do not understand that, because as far as I'm aware, Germany is part of the single market. And, uh, and, and therefore, it, as it enters the territorial sea, at least, certainly, it enters the single market of the European Union. So my point about all of this is, uh, I think, what has happened is that there's been a huge amount of obfuscation deliberately uh, uh, brought up in order to try and um, obfuscate the issues. But the point is, is the legal issues here are quite, uh, many of these are quite clear, quite hard. And the danger is, is the Nord Stream partners will end up, and possibly Germany, in the EU courts where they will lose. And my advice to the Central and Eastern European states was, if the, this it proceeds any further, then the basic message should be to the Nord Stream partners, and if necessary the Commission, is we will see you in court. There is actually one more, and this is, I'm going for the bonus points here for the most exotic legal argument uh, of, of the conference. And my exotic legal argument is this. There is one other public international law argument which is relevant. And this goes back to the context of the aggression between Russia, uh, 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 aggression of Russia against Ukraine. Under Article 2.4 of the UN Charter, well, flowing from that and the case law at the International Court of Justice, there are essentially two obligations for third states when uh, a state is invaded, uh, occupied, and annexed. The first is not to recognize it. The second is not to facilitate it. And the question is, does the, is Nord Stream 2 a facilitation of the waging of aggressive war against Ukraine? Now, think about it in economic warfare terms. What are you going to do to the enemy power? You're going to strip it of resources, and clearly, Ukraine will be stripped of some resources, about $2 billion in transit fees every year. And also, by virtue of ending the use of the transit pipeline, you'd make Ukraine less important, less valuable, and more easy to easily to isolate uh, uh, from the uh, European states. So you see those will be legitimate war aims from the point of view of the Russian Federation. And Nord Stream 2 assists those war aims. Therefore, are the, uh, does, are the corporate partners of Gazprom in the Nord Stream uh, uh, pipeline facilitating the waging of aggressive war against Ukraine? And that raises another issue, a number of issues. First of all, there's a public international law obligation on the, on, on the European Union in terms of how it applies its rules as a result. There's also the UNCLOS issue. Is can the UNCLOS, or can the... Um, the littoral states through, who, through which the Nord Stream pipeline will go, can they permit the, an ex, uh, the pipeline to go through uh, because of their duties to not facilitate the waging of aggressive war? Can they require the Russians to obtain a, an opinion from the Law of the Sea Tribunal in Hamburg before they proceed? And the other issue is, of course, <clears throat> whether or not the United States may see this as a basis <clears throat> on which they can legitimately um, <clears throat> uh, use the US Treasury sanctions system in order to sanction the Nord Stream pipeline. So all of this, of course, is rather negative. So I just want to finish with a positive point. And it seems to me that, as I said at the beginning, this is really, uh, we've had, well, we've had Nord Stream 1, we've had South Stream attempted, we've had Turkish Stream, we now have Nord Stream 2. And 
the point about all of this is that the Russians, I fear, are missing the picture. The big picture is that we're building, through the uh, energy liberalization program and the application of European competition rules, a very large single market in gas. We know that renewables cannot deliver uh, sustainable energy, uh, current technology, at scale and at reasonable costs. Gas, natural gas, 50% less CO2 emitting than coal, provides a significant green way forward to reduce CO2 emissions and provide a backup for uh, existing renewables. There's a potential of significantly expanding the natural gas market. Gazprom is the nearest supplier, the nearest, the, the gas vault to Europe, could provide gas uh, on a very large scale, along with Norway, into the European Union, and we could have a grand bargain on gas, with the Russians having substantial access to the market and providing gas on a low volume, uh, sorry, on a high volume, low price model. And that, I would argue, is should be the future, and for what the European Union and uh, corporate energy Europe should be trying to achieve, are not playing with more pipelines which have significant legal troubles. I shall stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Riley, for sharing your views on one single uh, pipeline project. Uh, uh, we have covered uh, diplomacy, we have covered energy law in, uh, in depth. Um, I forgot to introduce you at the beginning, I'm sorry about that, but I think everybody here in the room uh, knows uh, Professor Riley. Uh, I think the same applies to Mr. Mitchek, the next uh, speaker. Um, alias or his nickname, Mr. Nabucco. This is uh, how he got uh, famous in, in, in Europe um, as his, uh, in his function as managing director of Nabucco International, uh, a very important project of the past. Uh, he has got a long international career at OMV, uh, is now senior vice president for gas transport international at OMV. Um, and. Uh, yeah, now I think we're all wondering what will be his next nickname. It's your, uh, the floor is yours, Mr. Michek. Thank you, Mr. Penker. Um, I also would like to thank the organizers for the invitation uh, to this event. Um, and I have to confess, I, I have not read carefully enough the agenda of this session. Uh, because uh, I, missed, uh, I missed the Nord Stream agenda point. Um, but uh, Elne, you will not be surprised that I have some answers to your points. And uh, I also have some answers to another issue that was not mentioned so far in this event. Uh, we spoke about uh, regulatory frameworks and strategies and visions uh, and alliances. Uh, we, I haven't heard anything about customers and markets. And I think uh, I, can, I can cover this, this topic. And of course, I will also somehow reply uh, to Alan. Let me first show you the figures for gas demand production and imports for the decades to come because we have to face reality. We had a demand, uh, overall demand of 460 billion cubic meters in 2013. Uh, we faced a decline in 2014 with a recovery in 2015. And uh, the expectation is that the gas demand in Europe will slightly increase stepwise uh, until 2025 uh, to a level we have seen 2013. So that means not a lot of increase of gas demand in Europe. However, we'll see how climate policy in Europe will materialize with respect to coal-fired power plants. I haven't seen anything there. Any concrete steps? Visions, yes. Concrete steps, no. And then let us uh, see uh, the, the gas production. We had a gas production in 2013, um, including uh, Norway, of 264 billion cubic meters. We see a decline of this production uh, in, uh, in the major uh, production areas, 
so that we will end up in 2025 at about 200 billion cubic meters. That means that even if the gas demand will, would, be, would develop in a stable way or uh, with a moderate increase, gas imports to Europe will increase. And we have to see whether gas will be available. I mean, <laughs> diversification is a very important point. I've worked five years personally in a project in order to achieve diversification. At the end of the day, the project was not supported sufficiently. Um, and uh, I will come to, to uh, potential gas sources we may, we may identify in order to achieve diversification. However, we have to face that there is one important long-term reliable gas supplier, and that's Russia. And as Ellen also said, Europe and Russia will have to come to reliable and predictable and, and stable solutions. Um, let me a bit zoom into, into the gas production development of, of the major regions of production in Europe. That's on the one hand Norway, where we see uh, around about 100 billion cubic meters of uh, gas production, with a peak uh, somewhere now in 2015-17. However, uh, there is a quite substantial replacement rate. And uh, given the low oil and gas prices, I wonder if investors will invest sufficient uh, money into new fields, new developments to maintain these replacement rates so that Norway uh, can stabilize the output. The forecasts show a certain range, best case, worst case, between 65 and, and uh, close to 90 billion cubic meters in 2025. Netherlands, we had a peak production in 2013, 2012, 13 with uh, 80 billion cubic meters due to well-known reasons, seismic reasons, um, and, uh, and, and other reasons, production will go down drastically. Drastically to a range of uh, between uh, 20 and 35 billion cubic meters in 2025. Uh, UK, down from 80 to 25. So you see uh, that there is a tremendous gap to be filled in the decades to come. Now let me show you the gas flows in 2013 uh, to our European markets. As I mentioned, the 100 billion cubic meters from Norway to UK to Netherlands, mainly to the northwest of Europe, some quantities also to Central Europe, to, to Austria, uh, to Hungary, etc., but uh, no substantial quantities. Uh, we had 39 billion cubic meters of LNG flow in. Um, compared to 80 BCM two, three years earlier. So half of, uh, of that uh, quantities we saw before uh, arrived in, in Europe. Question is why? And there is a very, very simple rule in the gas business. And that is the gas flows technically to the lower pressure and commercially to the higher price. LNG is a global market, so I don't know if we can build our supply security on LNG. We see. North Africa, 28, 30 billion cubic meters uh, per year, and that's it. We received Russian gas. If I say we, that's Europe and Turkey, because I listened to Mr. Istori saying that uh, uh, we, we should uh, uh, also and again, um, somehow um, built up uh, an, an important alliance uh, with Turkey. Uh, Russian gas flows uh, into this region via Blue Stream to Turkey, via a southern branch uh, across Ukraine, um, and the Balkan, uh, Trans-Balkan pipeline through uh, Romania, Bulgaria, to Turkey, to the Western Belt, industrial belt in Turkey. Uh, Istanbul, Izmir, Bursa, via Ukraine, 
uh, via Yamal pipeline, Belarus and uh, Poland, and via Nord Stream. And uh, what we have seen, and that is something we also have to face, I mean, Germany, and also Czech, Czech Republic, by the way, received their Russian gas not via Ukraine in the last two years. They reached it via, got it via Nord Stream, also Czech Republic. So we have to face and we have to see reality and we have to see where the gas is flowing and the, where the gas will flow. That's 2030. A forecast or an anticipation how gas could flow in 2030. We see a slight decrease in Norway. We see a decrease in the uh, European production. I have uh, discussed earlier. We see um, a doubling or maybe even more than doubling the LNG uh, inflow. We see moderate quantities from Central Asia. We have no idea uh, f uh, from gas supply from the MENA states. Uh, and we see 200, around about 200 billion cubic meters from Russia. <coughs> That's also the reason why we need really stable agreements and a stable relationship between the two regions. That is important. Europe needs Russia, Russia needs Europe. And I know that's, that's not on the top agenda for the US, but I mean, I can't do anything about that. I want also to discuss a bit prerequisites uh, for gas corridors, because uh, it said Nord Stream is a political project. I can tell you uh, the political element is not brought in by the investors, but by other institutions. We have to provide to our shareholders and to bankers a reliable, profound business plan, a commercial business plan. We have to be bankable. We have nothing and no idea and no interest on politics. We have a, a huge investment uh, pocket. We have a huge and tremendous competition. We have pressure on the prices. We have to have reliable and uh, competitive logistic solutions, and we are working on that. We need for a gas corridor a reli reliable gas source or several gas sources, even better. We need reliable and predictable transit conditions, predictable on a long-term basis, and not doubling transit tariffs or reducing transit tariffs or shifting terms and conditions. We need connections to liquid gas hubs. We need a transparent, predictable, and synchronized legal framework. And we need credible partners. We need a minimization of political interference. And I think that are really absolute prerequisites for, for huge investments. And I, at the end of uh, my presentation, I would like to share some thoughts on diversification, liquidity of the market, energy union, etc. And it was rightly mentioned uh, already today that uh, uh, we have, first of all, to see how liquid our market areas within Europe, we see in Northwest Europe a liquid market. Several gas sources, diversification, gas hubs, short-term capacity, short-term available gas, uh, gas swaps, um, storage services, state-of-the-art, etc. In Central Europe, we have a semi-liquid market with uh, some flexibility, uh, but certainly not sufficient. And we have an illiquid market in Southeast Europe without hubs, without short-term transactions, without state-of-the-art storage services, and without diversification. That's absolutely correct. And that is something um, the industry uh, has to work on. But a Nord Stream invest not, investment does not prevent anybody, any interested investor, to build up a southern gas corridor. I mean, that are the pictures 
uh, from the European Commission in 2014. We see the hub concept in Europe with the Central European Gas Hub as uh, the, uh, the east-southeastern uh, hub and uh, no, no other hub in, in this concept east uh, or south of, uh, of Baumgarten. And that's what we would need, definitely. And we see if the Mediterranean gas hub uh, uh, will, will fly uh, at, at a certain point in time. And uh, on the right hand, you see how the Commission saw Southeast Europe in 2014. So a lot of bottlenecks, uh, uh, a lot of stumbling blocks, no interconnections, no interoperability, etc. Unfortunately, this picture hasn't changed at all till today. And, and that's what we need. That's what we definitely need. We have to increase the interconnectivity. We have to balance the gas supply, no doubt. But we also have to see and to develop in the responsibility we have towards our customers as a gas supplier to European end users we have to have a stable gas supply beyond 2019. We don't see any solution in Southeast Europe and we have to bring the gas to our delivery points and to the hubs and to the end users for the decades to come. And that's what we are working on. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks a lot, uh, Mr. Mitchek, uh, for your views. You focused more on the economics, economic aspects. Um, today, this morning, we, we heard from uh, General Director Ristori that global LNG supply uh, is set to expand dramatically, with United States, Australia becoming major players. Asian and EU prices are converging and falling. And this creates, of course, new opportunities. On the other hand, there is a need for diversification in regions dependent on one single supplier. And our next speaker really knows what that means. Andreas Schimkos, gas expert at the Energy Community Secretariat, previously for eight years uh, was pract practicing energy law as an in-house counsel and attorney. He worked with major energy infrastructure and regulatory projects in the Baltics, Poland, and Scandinavia. And for almost three years, he was a leading external counsel for leg legislative and regulatory developments of the LNG terminal in Lithuania. Today, he will reveal how to set up LNG contracts. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Since I'm representing the Energy Community Secretariat, welcome to my home. Uh, and I will shift a little bit to a different topic uh, from pipeline gas to the LNG gas, which is, of course, in recent days is not that hot. Uh, <laughs> but still, its importance is becoming bigger and bigger. And to start with this winter, together with the uh, Energy Union's winter package, the European Commission released the LNG and storage strategy. And that was for sure for the same time when the European Commission took such a deep uh, notice to the LNG markets and the LNG developments in Europe. And what the European Commission says in that strategy is that further diversification, because of the dropping uh, production of natural gas in Europe, uh, and potentially increasing, well, the demand is now decreasing, but potentially it will increase, as we just saw in the statistics in the previous presentation. Uh, the further diversification of sources, routes, and suppliers is a must for the European Union. Uh, and the other aspect is that LNG, because of the increasing market and uh, increasing market liquidity in the field, uh, and decreasing prices consequently is a major opportunity for the entire Europe. Uh, now, there are three aspects which are targeted uh, by the European Commission in that strategy, uh, signifying the, the importance of the, of the LNG. 
First of all, it's security of supply and resilience. While talking about the security of supply, it is obvious that almost in each and every case, the LNG terminal built in the country, where its efficiency increased, opens the new sources and the new routes for supplies. Uh, especially having in mind the so-called blending of LNG when uh, there is a possibility to have LNG, to purchase LNG from sev several liquefaction facilities and to bring them to the LNG terminal opens enormous possibilities to negotiate and enormous possibilities to choose uh, the different suppliers, especially after the United States will eventually come to the European markets. The other aspect is, of course, the competitiveness and... Uh, the only member state which is uh, mentioned in the very first pages of the strategy is my beloved Lithuania, and for a reason. And as European Commission says, even the potential of the LNG terminal uh, increased the competitiveness in the Lithuanian market. As you all know, before the LNG terminal, uh, the Baltic states were 100% dependent on the supplies from Russia. There is only one branch coming to Lithuania, uh, connecting Lithuania with the Yamal pipeline in Belarus. And after Lithuanians declared and showed actual uh, actions, well, real actions in building the terminal, uh, the Gazprom immediately became a very friendly partner and gave almost more than 20, almost 25% discount for the gas prices, which were one of the highest in Europe. Uh, and of course, now Lithuanians even get forward. Uh, it is, there are kind of, well, it's still speculations, not, not expressed in numbers, but almost 90% uh, of the gas imports should be reached this year already from, Norve from Norway, uh, Norwegian supplier Statoil, because, well, the demand is a little bit decreasing, approximately 2.6 BCM annually now in Lithuania. And there are also rumors that uh, the biggest consumer, the fertilizer company in Lithuania, which consumes over 1 BCM annually, uh, will stop buying from gas, from natural gas, and will start uh, trading with Statoil, because now Statoil for this year, the contract was reviewed, and discount was one-third of the previous contract. So the LNG prices are decreasing, and the there is a chance that Lithuania will quit trading with Gazprom at all, and the biggest uh, example is that one of the two Gazprom's intermediaries in the country were already shut last week. Uh, the third aspect is the sustainability, because the usage of LNG uh, is also a potential to use LNG in, uh, as a fuel, uh, first of all in heavy-duty vehicles and uh, in the ships. For example, the Lithuanian LNG terminal is now extending uh, its business model uh, into the bunkering services, and it might be a potential for future. Now, while talking about the LNG uh, from the legal perspective, uh, we can take two, two shifts. Uh, one, the regulatory, uh, those provisions which come from the third package, and another one is the contractual one. So for today, I will talk about not what is written uh, in the laws, but what is in practice. Because, well, if we would compare uh, the gas trading uh, with the fashion market, so probably the LNG from haute couture, from total avant-garde, now becomes something what's very popular, and all the countries which can afford that because of geographical location, because of business situation, is looking towards the LNG markets. And particularly, the European Commission specifies in, the, in this uh, previously mentioned uh, strategy for LNG, that there is not also a need for the efficiency for uh, exploiting at the higher level the current uh, LNG facilities, but also to build ones. And for example, for the Baltics, there is also a plan to build one, whether in Estonia or Finland or both. Uh, so there are two ways, uh, main ways, main, uh, main contracts to purchase LNG in the international markets. Uh, is a tolling agreement and the standard sale purchase agreement. I'll briefly describe both of them. Uh, under the tolling agreement, uh, the customer itself purchases feed gas and delivers to the liquefaction facility for liquefaction services, uh, where the natural gas is being liquefied. <coughs> and based on the tolling agreement, uh, the liquefaction facility gives back the LNG to the customer at its own facility, usually at the loading point of the customer's vessel, 
And it depends on which standard uh, term of the INCO terms you are choosing, whether it's X works or, or different way. Uh, but all in all, the principle of the tolling is that the liquefaction facility is responsible for uh, producing the LNG, for liquefying the feed gas, and delivering to your vessel without loading. Then the customer itself is responsible for transporting the shipping uh, of LNG to the delivery point, to the delivery port, uh, or to the LNG terminal, and is directly responsible for liquefaction, uh, sorry, for regasification at the LNG terminal under the regulated terms, uh, uh, applying, applying <coughs> applicable in the particular country, uh, further transportation through the system, uh, and market realization, whether it's the supply or consumption for its own needs, uh, which is, of course, very rare for now, but who may know? Who knows uh, how it will develop? Uh, the sale and purchase contract is a little bit different story. The seller then purchases feed gas uh, in the market, delivers to liquefaction facility, takes back the LNG, and sells to the customer. Well, usually, it depends actually, the, the delivery point might be dual, whether it's the uh, loading point of a liquefaction facility, when you're using uh, the services of the seller only for loading to the customer's vessel, or whether it's the LNG terminal itself. Well, for example, the Lithuanian case, the Statol uh, brings LNG uh, to the terminal, and since the unloading, the ownership of the LNG goes to the uh, seller who procures uh, the LNG from Statoil. And in this case, the shipping, depending on the agreement, might be the uh, liability of the, uh, of the seller or the customer, but then again, uh, other aspects, other further actions, regasification, transportation, and uh, market realization <coughs> is the customer's <coughs> issue. Now briefly, about the main provisions, uh, the main obstacles. The LNG terminals are not, uh, the, the LNG contracts uh, are not that uh, preconditioned by history. And that is a good point because at least in Central, well, in, in Eastern Europe in particular, in the Baltics and with uh, energy community parties uh, with whom I'm working most, uh, we actually we have the standard Gazprom uh, contract almost all the time with all those uh, badly uh, taken provisions from the historical point of view with, of course, with take or pay, with destination clauses and other uncompetitive measures uh, and instruments applying. Now, the LNG contracts usually don't do have this and they're much more flexible. Uh, as for tolling agreement, uh, what is the most important is that the liquefaction facility <coughs> is responsible for treating the gas uh, in the facility uh, rendering the liquefaction service and then depends on the agreement uh, at certain point, uh, certain storage, whether feed gas or LNG might be requested by the customer. Uh, and of course, the customer is usually required to pay the fixed charge uh, for, well, not using the services, but applying uh, for the services and then the variable charge for the services uh, actually uh, ordered. For the sale and purchase agreement, uh, again, as I mentioned, uh, the seller might be responsible, is always responsible for delivering the gas to the agreed loading point <coughs> and might be responsible for shipping if that is agreed with the customer. The customer, of course, uh, is responsible for payment of the LNG plus additional services. And usually in this case, uh, not like in, uh, in the tolling agreement, uh, the customer pays for the LNG and usually uh, the price is linked to some market indexation. Now, what is very important uh, in the sale and purchase agreement, and that's the main difference uh, from the pipeline contracts, let's say pipeline transportation contracts, is that the quantity adjustments are much more flexible and also usually uh, the operational tolerance, depending on the LNG facilities and the LNG terminals operational situation are foreseen also in all contracts. Uh, Again, I have to notify there that destination clauses are, is a measure which is not competitive and not allowed in all contracts. Uh, now the conditions precedent. Uh, historically, actually, what formed for the LNG contracts is that mainly they were uh, being concluded for a long-term perspective, especially that's very noticeable in the United States. Uh, where the LNG contracts are already concluded before the LNG uh, liquefaction facilities uh, are being uh, operational, are launched for operation. 
Uh, so that's why there are several issues and the conditions precedent in all contracts to be taken into account. Uh, the first of all, infrastructure developments and commercial operations. So in other words, both contracting parties want to secure themselves and uh, not to, to get liable in case certain operational issues are being delayed for the liquefaction facilities or for LNG terminals uh, and to secure uh, themselves from the damages. Now, as regards the damages, uh, it's a little bit easier in case of the sale and purchase agreement. Uh, there is still usual a take or pay commitment, uh, which is for certain reason and for the increased importance of the short-term contracts and the spot trading and the LG markets is decreasing its importance. Uh, and of course, the damage compensation, as I mentioned, since the, under the sales, uh, sales and purchase agreement, uh, the customer pays for the actual LNG delivered and usually the price is, is based on certain price market indexa indexation. Uh, for example, MBP, it's easy to calculate uh, the damages in cases of non-delivery or uh, non-taking over. Uh, under the tolling agreement, since the customer is paying for the service, it's a little bit more difficult uh, to measure the damages, but also the those couple of tolling contracts which I saw while well, coming from the United States, they actually they have this requirement in case the liquefaction facility uh, fail for certain reason uh, to provide a service, it has to compensate, whether to compensate or to buy an, uh, an equal share of the LNG, adequate share of the LNG in the market and to supply to its, uh, to deliver to its uh, customer. Uh, then termination issues, as in each contract, of course, it's very important uh, to have certain provisions. Uh, as regards early termination rights, the most uh, usual examples are free. Uh, so first of all, of course, the standard legal uh, provision, the contractual parties fault, uh, then force majeure, because in the LNG business, especially if we are having in mind transatlantic shipping, uh, there are lots of uh, issues which are not dependent on the, on, the, on the contractual parties and authorizations, regulatory effects, especially this is in, uh, in United States because these regulatory issues are still there developing. There are several uh, future liquefaction facilities which still don't have uh, the re necessary authorizations, whether for liquefaction operations or for the exports to, to, the, to other countries. So these are uh, issues which are, have to be taken into account in each contract. And now the final slide of my presentation for today is that volumes and destinations uh, are pretty much flexible for the long-term contracts, unlike this is the case for the pipeline uh, transportation. And as the previous presenter said, maybe the LNG will not be the cure uh, for the Europe to solve its energy problems. But in certain points, for example, for certain countries which faced 100% dependency on one supplier and noticing the further developments, especially Nord Stream, for example, for the Baltic states, for Finland, and partly for Poland, probably there's option then to develop LNG and to strengthen the interconnectors in, because in case Nord Stream comes, this is not only Ukraine who will starve, uh, this is also the supplies through Yamal pipeline will be minimized as well. Uh, the other option is, the other trend uh, is the short-term contract and the spot trading. This is uh, an alternative option comparing to the long-term and medium-term. Uh, tolling or sale purchase contracts and uh, the role of the short-term contracts in the LNG markets is increasing uh, mainly because of the market liquidity and as I mentioned the blending of LNG that is procuring LNG from different suppliers uh, or from different liquefaction factories. Uh, sourcing supply from multiple locations also the LNG opens uh, an amazing opportunity to have different suppliers to the same uh, to the same LNG terminal. And the fourth issue, swap agreements and re-export bunkering services. This, these are the additional uh, benefits from the LNG terminal and the LNG supplies. So thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for your attention. Thank you very much, Mr. Shimkos. Yeah. Thanks, thanks a lot. We are running a bit late. Um, so I would like to ask uh, Mr. Koch from the European Commission uh, on the floor. Um, our last speaker today. So 
it's up to him to solve all open issues. Uh, we dis discussed uh, after our today's discussion. Oliver Koch is deputy head of unit in the internal market unit of the Commission's Energy Directorate General, DG Ena. Uh, as we learned from Commissioner Caniete uh, this week in Amsterdam uh, at the Informal Energy Council, um, this market design initiative that you prepare, that you're currently preparing, will be a very ambitious uh, piece of legislation, a, piece, uh, a very ambitious proposal. Um, uh, so we are very uh, curious about that. Um, uh, Mr. Koch uh, also coordinates the legal work of the unit, notably concerning the enforcement of EU law uh, uh, rules vis-a-vis -vis member states, as well as the teams dealing with external aspects of the inter internal energy market, for example, negotiations with Switzerland, Norway, the energy community, or Russia. Um, in 2015, he has led the team setting up a new security of supply unit with, within DG Energy. Uh, so, Mr. Koch, uh, in English, Mr. Cook, um, I'm convinced you have prepared us a very delicious presentation. Thank you very much. Don't speak too much of uh, food. Uh, I will promise not to be too long as the only obstacle between you and the lunch break and maybe a short but condensed and intelligent discussion in between. Uh, it's indeed a good thing. Um, I will not talk about market design uh, uh, today. I will talk about the one thing essentially that, that was my previous baby, that is a reform of the security of supply cooperation framework. Uh, and the title that was given to me, indeed a pan-European security of supply uh, framework is what uh, we wanted to bridge. And I will be very short, I just have a few slides. Uh, I will not go uh, into the discussion. There's no word on North Stream in my title, so I can spare you this, uh, fortunately. Uh, but I think it's an important development. It's very deep to, to, to this place, to, to the energy community, because it's really addressing one of the key issues. I could name my, my presentation also, um, um, solidarity, is it just a word? Uh, and that's the question we have and many of you, the energy community has asked us, and yesterday at a meeting they asked me again, I mean, what about your bloody reciprocity? I mean, where's, what can you do about it? I and mean, what, what I want to talk about is that we have a project in place that tries first very careful attempt to uh, uh, say that solidarity is not just a word. And that's linked to internal cooperation inside the EU, but that's also linked to the uh, cooperation between the EU and the energy community country. In both areas, we were always asked, so apart from the political statements you make that we should all love each other and should cooperate, especially in crises, uh, what are you actually doing? Uh, we see just whenever we have a crisis, countries cut off lines and things are not happening so well. Uh, and we, we really felt the need to deliver there and that's what I will just set out in a few, few slides today. So. So where did this idea come from? Um, it came actually from the experience in some crises. We had um, the, the stress test, I think Dominic even yesterday mentioned it again. Um, it was a quite revealing exercise. When the gas crisis 2014 uh, was ongoing, we, we were mandated to do a stress test to really say, okay, what if really all Russian supplies would uh, uh, cease uh, to exist? Uh, what in a super escalation scenario? And one of the findings of this uh, uh, um, uh, exercise, maybe somewhere hidden in a press release, uh, was actually that we could really show and, and felt and talking to the TSOs, we saw that it makes a big difference if you cooperate or if you don't cooperate. If national member states in a crisis start cutting their borders, keeping their own resources, uh, the overall uh, welfare will clearly be reduced. And not only that, but many countries, and that's on the right-hand side, will be in the deep red. And by the way, that's uh, uh, mainly energy community countries. So cooperation also in case of crisis is a necessary element um, of a functioning security of supply country of each country. Uh, and that's in the field of gas. I will just pick you one element that's from electricity what we showed will show to member states very soon we have exactly the same need for cooperation and security of supply and electricity that's just an illustration of 
the adequacy assessments, the famous assessment, do we have enough generation? I think uh, Mr. Riechmann was talking about this. And just to give you again the snapshot, that's the national assessment uh, from the TSOs, what the current planning is, do we have enough generation in 2020, 2015 under the uh, uh, NCE estimates. If you look from an individual country, you're all in red. If you just aggregate today already the figures, you see that we have ample of generation and we will have ample of over generation even 2015, 2020 and 2025. So it makes a big difference to have an aggregated coordinated policy or to have a fragmented policy. So that's the why. And I think here also having talked about gas, it should be clear. Uh, the more difficult part was the how. Again, it was easy to come out with policy papers and communications from the commission and, and, and president events that said we should all be solidaric and, and uh, to, even to create the energy union and to write a paper that solidarity is at the heart of the energy union. But what, what matters, and, and I'm quite happy about the first step into this direction, is indeed that um, there is an attempt to overcome the issues. And one of the issues, indeed, that's a slide we were also showing in the framework of, uh, of uh, electricity, it's all nice to say we should be solidaric, but the, the lachmus test, the test of this is when you have parallel scarcity. Um, and I use the example of, of salt in the winter when, when Belgium suddenly found itself without salt because French had also very cold winter and they said, sorry, we usually supply you with salt, but this year we need everything for ourselves. So roads were icy in Belgium uh, uh, and uh, Belgium was very angry about this and said, we will now do our own capacity and storage of salt instead of cooperating with France and finding a key how to in, uh, organize it intelligently. Um, but this is indeed the key question. How do we deal with parallel crisis? How do we actually legally share in such a crisis? And the, the act that is now on the table and where I'm quite happy that it has come from a reflection phase we have started one, two years ago to a concrete proposal is the gas security of supply regulation. Uh, um, we have published it, I hope, I mean, again, something, if you fly back, uh, download it on the airport and have a look, especially at articles 12, 13, 15, in the end, there is some innovative stuff in it, and I will just mention it a little bit, because we think it's important. That's a commission proposal for a revision of a commission, directly binding commission regulation, um, that we have seen, and that in the stress test we've seen is good, but has some room for improvement, and these are the improvements, what are they? So first, most important, as, as Dominique said, we, we need to shift from a national to regional approach, but that's made very concrete. Um, we will have regional plans and they will be much more uh, important in practice than previously. That's an uphill fight with the member states. We are not sure that we get an agreement for this in the council. We are trying really to argue uh, with our experience of the stress test that that's the only way that makes sense to have an integrated view uh, if a pipeline comes from one country, you have to see well, how the others behave to assess your own safety. It doesn't make any sense if you assess your safety on the basis of what happens inside uh, without coordinating what the neighbor is doing in a crisis. Uh, this was one of the main findings of the stress test. We want to translate this into law by more regional planning, the risk assessments, the emergency plans. Um, and that indeed is an important element of this legal proposal. The next one is even more uh, important for, for the title of my speech is solidarity just a word. I would say probably for the very first time there is an article which is even entitled solidarity, uh, uh, funny enough, but behind it doesn't say we should use best effort to, uh, uh, to apply solidarity in all our actions. You will find a very clear rule that essentially proposes first we define who is really in need also, I think uh, uh, Mr. Story was explaining, I mean, uh, households, uh, uh, hospitals, uh, essential facilities, so they should be supplied in a crisis. If there's really a crisis, they should have supply. Everybody has done it. That was already in the old legislation. The new element is that we say, okay, if you have a neighbor country in a big pipeline, you have ample of gas, but your neighbors are dying. They are freezing. And we had in cold spells people really actually dying. Um, you have an obligation to ship gas to this country uh, if you can easily supply your protected customers. Um, I think about it, this is quite a far-reaching proposal, but this is what solidarity means in practice. We need really to spell it out, and I think it's the first attempt to really spell out how we envisage sharing, indeed, and, and 
responsibility on a shared basis. So if your neighbors are really have a manifest problem, you don't have it, we create actually an obligation to find an agreement to ship some gas there, not to the extent that your own uh, citizens suffer, uh, but to the extent that we apply solidarity. We, we believe there's a very important uh, uh, element of the proposal, and as I said, there, there is an article on it, uh, uh, Article 12 of the proposal. Have a look at it. We, we really believe it is uh, a fascinating and important step forwards to, to really fill the energy union terminology with life and, and, and legal reality. The last element, and that's important for this forum, because also there we think it's, it's to somewhat a very important, if not groundbreaking, first step to overcome an issue we had. Um, because we did not have the legal solutions to cooperate uh, in the fields where we think it's important with energy community contracting parties uh, as we would like. They are third countries, they have EU law in place, but we saw all over the place that there were problems in the cooperation. So this is the famous security region. We, we say, all our commissioners say, yeah, the, 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 the Ukraine, is, we are all part of it and, and uh, we must think in one union, in one region. But when they then come to us and, and, and ask the lawyers, yeah, how can we just build them in? Uh, the lawyers were telling them that, yeah, that's all fine, but we have a legal problem there because we have EU countries, we have binding obligations and where we have institutions and we don't have uh, uh, solutions for how to deal with energy community in a legal manner. What do we do with the obligations, with the mutual obligations at the borders? So the first thing I think we can fill relatively easily, we had no security of supply le legislation in the energy community, there we will move. There will be hopefully a proposal for a, a joint act uh, for something that takes over the main elements of security of supply. That's easy always to put something in the energy community. What is not easy, and we see this in all fields of energy, electricity, uh, building electricity trading, is how do we solve at the borders uh, uh, the mutual obligations between EU countries and energy community countries. We need to make sure that, to be very concrete, if you have an obligation to organize a reverse flow, a European country can also be forced to organize this reverse flow towards an energy community country. And the energy community can go to the Secretariat to enforce something with energy community members, but not so easily to enforce something against EU members. Um, and the same for the coordination of plan. If we have a regional plan now, it's clear that in certain regions, I mean, energy community countries are just the ones with the pipeline. So we need to integrate them. It would be silly. Again, we could start with Ukraine, but go to, to the whole energy community where we have pipelines. We need to integrate them in the planning. And the planning has sanctions. If you don't submit the plan, we can change the plans. We had no legal instruments for this. Um, and solidarity, it would also be interesting. Is solidarity an inner EU question or will we come even to the uh, result that solidarity will be also applied vis-a-vis -vis uh, energy community contracting parties? So we will see that that were the opt obstacles and we have a first attempt to provide a solution there. So yes, we will introduce legislation in the energy community that enables this cooperation. And on the uh, uh, EU side, there is something uh, which is called a switch on clause. It's a terrible name. I don't know when and where it came on in, in complex legal discussions. But it actually means a clarification that the EU member states are legally obliged also to cooperate with their neighbors in the energy community. So they have to consult the plans. They have to organize the reserve flows. They also uh, have to uh, apply the whatever curtailment prohibitions and crisis and all the elements that we have put in the regulation now. Um, and that uh, is the proposal to make it very clear that we have a mutual obligation, which we did not have before, but now we put it into legislation. If the parliament, the council agree on this approach, we hope that indeed we can put together, if at the same time the energy community uh, adopts this and agrees also to this approach, at one point we can really switch the button and the switch on will be we can create a security region, uh, which would not be political, just a declaration, it would be a legally functioning and enforceable uh, mechanism. And I think that really brings uh, this security cooperation into a new dimension. It is important. Um, I really can just, with a short snapshot, uh, invite you, have a look at the proposal. It's quite interesting. We would love to have your support for it. It's not for granted that it will survive in the council and with the parliament. We very much hope so. 
we hope also that the people in this room support the idea and are with us in the battle we will have ahead of us. We think it's a potentially useful step. We can also then apply another. I mean, we are just discussing electricity regions and other regions. If we have a legal solution to bridge the gap between energy union and energy community in place, uh, we think we can really bring true progress to uh, uh, the cooperation in, within a bigger region. So we hope you support it. And uh, uh, yeah, you wish us a good luck for the further process. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Mr. Koch, and uh, thank you to all the speakers uh, also for their uh, time, uh, uh, to respecting the times, yeah, for the time efficiency. Uh, but still, I, uh, if I look at my watch, we are running late. Uh, we should head for lunch. However, uh, if the organizers allow, uh, I will open the floor for a discussion. Please keep the questions and the answers very uh, limited. Very, yeah. <laughs> First question. Uh, hello, my name is Elizaveta Badanova. I'm representing Aftergaz of Ukraine. And um, surprisingly, I. Oh. <laughs> Happy birthday. Thank you, dear. Uh, and surprisingly, I have, a, I have a question to Oliver rather than to uh, people on the Nord Stream. And um, um, we uh, support really the uh, proposal of the European Commission in terms of the uh, regional groups. And um, my question relates to whether simply saying um, the energy community parties were actually contracting parties, actually included in the, in the regional groups. Because if you see the proposal, uh, what we can see in Article 15, which uh, gives the way for cooperation with the energy community, it practically relates to obligations of the EU member states and the EU to take into account the context of the energy community rather than to include the energy community into the process of preparation of joint and regional emergency and preventive action plans. And in this sense, um, if we include the energy community contracting parties in the emergency, I mean prevention and emergency action plans, then it will be easier to apply the switch on clause because you already will have some kind of track record in terms of cooperation. Because now I think you're also struggling with understanding how you can switch on and how you can detem determine who implemented what. But here you can actually allow at least some sort of um, easier way to do that. And we as Ukraine are very interested in getting in the uh, preventive and emergency measures together with the EU, because, I mean, it doesn't make any sense to just apply solidarity in the end, right? Solidarity towards the energy community, when you can include them in the prevention measures. And uh, just to give an example, we're going to launch soon with the European Commission the joint um, risk assessment. So it's already on. That's that, the, but the question really relates to whether when the European Commission started drafting and the, the original idea, I know that it may not necessarily survive in the Council, but the original idea was um, it envisaged that the contracting parties will be in the, in the um, regional groups. Thank you. Yes, another question. The lady uh, in the middle, yes, in the center. Hello, my name is Kirsten Westphal from the German Institute for International and Security Affairs. And not surprisingly, I will have a question on Nord Stream, but first to Oliver Koch, a question. Uh, we talked that morning very much and, and quite long about NSOC and ACER, and my question would be for the regional approach, do we have the right bodies and institutions in place to put this uh, forward and to push that forward? And then to um, the Nord Stream case, my question would be, Ellen, you described that there would be room for, or there would be possibilities for a grand bargain with yeah. Russia. So I would like to know more about that. And also whether you see room to accommodate Nord Stream within the energy union, because from my point of view, it's not such a foregone conclusion that Nord Stream Two is not an upstream pipeline, but rather um, a transmission pipeline, and there seems to be not an anonymous um, meaning in the uh, Commission as well. So I do see that there is still room for political maneuver and bargaining. 
And uh, the last point on that, maybe also to Mr. Mitchek, is how do you view the changes in Russia itself? Because we've seen steps of reforms, we've seen auctions, we have quite a large pressure to at least partially liberalize the pipeline export monopoly in Russia as well. So how would that change the pictures? Thank you. Okay. So Professor Riley, maybe? Okay. Yeah? yeah. Um, let me just start with the, on the grand bargain threshold. Should I, should I use the Okay. Okay. On the um, grand bargain, I think the point about this is that there is an enormous opportunity here, which is uh, obviously there is, for a lot of European member states, uh, there is a huge difficulty uh, with uh, relying on the Russians. Uh, Reinhardt is wrong to say there's been no supply disruption. It is true, of course, for Western Europe, apart from 06 and 09. But if you read uh, Robert Larson's book, in fact, are produced by the Swedish Defence Research Agency, there were 40 politically motivated cutoffs between 1991 and 2004 in Central Eastern Europe and the Baltic states. So one of the troubles is when uh, the partners of Nord Stream and the Russians say, oh, you can always rely on us, we've never cut you off, etc., etc., since 1967, that may be true for Western Europe, but you lose your audience in Central Eastern Europe and the Baltic states. And that creates, that, that, so there is, a, there is a very deep supply security fear in relation to Central Eastern Europe and the Baltic states. And they've got good reason for it. Uh, the Larson book is, provides a tremendous amount of evidence of those politically motivated energy cutoffs. Now, the point about that is that creating a single market in gas itself provides a significant degree of supply security. The second is that the, is the other element which makes it easier to take loss of Russian gas, ironically, is the increasing availability of LNG. And one of the things I disagree with Reinhardt on all of this, he talks about all the declining European resources, and that's true. But Reinhardt, it's not 2006. You know, the shale revolution has happened. Uh, there is enormous amounts of gas available. And the, we're only at the beginning of the shale revolution. We've had the US revolution. And in the next few years, into the 2020s, there'll be the international shale revolution. It may not happen in Europe, but it will happen in the rest of the world. And you've also got, on top of that, the Chinese impact. And the thing about it is, and again, this is a, uh, I, I do quite a bit of stuff on China as well, but one of the really interesting things about what's happening in China, you're having a historic shift. For the last 40 years, since Deng Xiaoping opened up China, we have had this fantastic level of economic growth. But ultimately, it's not sustainable. It is enormous amounts of foreign direct investment going in, um, uh, huge amounts of uh, production of low quality uh, goods, which have had uh, an enormous impact on global markets. But China, this is ultimately not sustainable. The Chinese government is switching the, the uh, economy to a similar growth, but a much lower growth model, which is sustainable in the long term. So we're going from a 6 to 8% growth model to a 2 to 4% growth model. The problem is, is the global energy markets have been assuming this would go on forever and have built enormous uh, production facilities, Australia and elsewhere. You've got the US coming on stream as well. And that is going to create immense amounts of liquidity. Already, we have got uh, the Chinese reselling energy cargoes uh, on the Asia Pacific markets. So the, the, the point about it is that there is going to be a substantial amount of gas. We don't have to worry particularly about the decline of, of European uh, supplies because there's going to be lots of gas from elsewhere. And the, the, the other point about it is that that gas can get into European markets at very low levels. I mean, if you look at the, the James Henderson had a paper at the Oxford Institute of Energy Studies recently, and he was pointing out that at short run marginal cost, current Henry Hub prices, gas can be delivered into Europe at $3.30 MMBTU, and the average price for Russian gas last year was $6.80. Now, even at average prices for, for last year in Russia in, in US overall, you're still getting into Europe at $4.50. Now, this is a long way around of saying the point is, is that we can actually do a deal with the Russians because we feel fairly secure that there's going to be loads of other gas available. Uh, ironically, the more alternative suppliers are, uh, there are available uh, and the more our power market is interconnected, the easier it is to deal, deal with the Russians. And what it is for the Russians is to say, look, there is, that's part of the reason why we can do a deal with you. The other is, is that gas provides us with this tremendous capacity to de deliver on our sustainability and competitiveness ob 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 objectives. 
And what makes it easier is because of the falling price of gas, gas is more competitive about coal, we don't have to worry so much about coal uh, driving gas out of the market as we have before. And with a bit of work on the emissions trading scheme, we can expand the scope of the gas market. Now, that's all part of the deal with the Russians. We will take steps to ensure the gas market is larger and much more substantial. And you provide us with a high, you work on a high volume, low price model. And we all win. But that means really also, if you're focusing on price, you want to use amortized pipelines, which are you don't build new pipelines which are expensive in a competitive market when you were facing American and Australian and Qatari competition, which means that actually you want to do a deal with Ukrainians to expand the existing Ukrainian pipeline network and use, use the full optimum of that network. You perhaps might build YAML, you might build the YAML 2 along the same side, cheaper again. But what you don't do is you build expensive pipelines in the sea. And I think this, the, the, the whole point, the whole structure of this is that if you're focusing on price and cost, then you don't do things like Nord Stream. And there is a deal to be done there. And the question is, is can we get to a situation with the Russians where we can have a discussion, where we can actually work through a grand bargain? On the upstream pipeline, I'm sorry, I just cannot see how you can actually fit Article, 30, uh, Article 34 with the, with the Nord Stream Pipeline. The essential point is, is you've got the Russian main gas transmission system, you've got the European transmission system, you're putting a pipeline between them. Article 34 cannot uh, fit that, cannot bear the weight of that proposition. And my argument about that is if, for example, the German regulator were to take that view, I think you can pretty be sure that as soon as there's a decision, Poland will bring an action against Germany in the ECJ. Remember, member states can bring actions against one another. Usually, it's usually the UK v France, but in this case, it may be Poland v Germany. But the point about it is, is that you, you will end up in court. And uh, I think there'll be only one result in the ECJ. I shall uh, perhaps stop there. Thank you. Yes, uh, very briefly, I would also like to give Mr. Mitchik a chance to react, but please, uh, uh, really, uh, uh, a very uh, fast answer. I, I, I promise I will not do a second presentation. Um, first answer to Ms. Westphal on, on her question uh, on my opinion on uh, political development and reforms in Russia. Um, I ask for your understanding that I do not comment on political developments, not on Russia, not on <laughs> Turkey, uh, not on uh, the sense of European sense of solidarity, because you're right. I mean, we, we have seen uh, the acid test for solidarity in the last month, uh, when we had to manage uh, the stream, or have to manage the stream of refugees, we see that there's no solidarity on salt, we see there's no solidarity on anything, uh, so therefore we need legal obligations. Okay. Um, and I also want to answer a bit to, to Alan. Uh, speaking, I mean, I understand that you somehow market US LNG gas, that's fine. Uh, by the way, the first cargoes of US LNG went to uh, Argentina and Brazil, not to Europe. I ask myself why. Um, I don't like to speak about US shell gas revolution. I, I don't want to speak about revolutions. I like more to speak about evolutions. Um, and uh, as I said, first cargoes uh, went to, to, to South America. Um, and uh, I mean, it should not be a headache to you. If US LNG gas is competitive and will reach Europe at competitive prices, it will come, no doubt. So what? Thank you. Uh, Mr. Koch, would you like to add? Yeah, if just to, to, to react uh, to, to one of the elements Mr. Michik uh, said, because I don't want, want to be uh, uh, understood wrongly, I mean, the stress has showed that, and uh, that the Ukraine crisis showed that there is solidarity. I mean, don't get me wrong. I don't say it's all a failure. I don't comment on the on the refugee crisis, but both shows that we just shouldn't be stupid and leave it with political declarations. We need to organize solidarity. It's too important. That's the only thing. I've, I deeply believe in solidarity, and that it's possible. It's our bloody duty in the EU to organize a framework for this, and that's true for energy, and I'm fortunately only here for energy to speak about it. But it's not a failure. 
I, mean, I want to be very clear because there I'm, I'm sensitive uh, and we had fantastic and Lisa can say, I mean, I think the Ukraine saw that there was to a certain extent solidarity and we had tangible effects in the crisis of actual behavior of many member states who jumped in and were ready to, to make deals that pr previously were not uh, possible. So I'm not negative about solidarity. That's the first thing. And then I had two regulatory questions. I think the first came, um, what about ASA uh, uh, and SOE? Do we have the right framework in place? Um, we have no intention to change. The, the question is not, do we need something different, but how can we improve it? And we had on NSOE and NSOD uh, the question, uh, I think uh, Mr. Riechmann said, yeah, but this is a bit dodgy. There are lobbyists and there are regulators at the same time. What nobody has proposed us, although we asked for it explicitly even the consultation, uh, a, a real proposal how to solve the problem. That the one came today, I think, uh, 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 from uh, uh, one presentation. Apply ITO rules, yes. So unbundle uh, and see. It's very difficult if you if you understand it. So we have to deal uh, with the reality. Uh, put them at equal footing, maybe with other uh, 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 institutions, with DSOs and other stakeholders. Get away a bit from exclusivity. Uh, have checks and balances, and their ACER becomes uh, important to in indeed increase ACER. Uh, but that's a dilemma where we still wait for good proposals. So you have eight weeks chance, if, if you give me a good proposal, how to make a clearer separation between NSOE's lobby interests and their regulatory functions, uh, I will immediately adopt it. We haven't found a legally working uh, uh, proposal there. Uh, ASA the same. We, we find ASA is fantastic, but we've seen the deficiencies so far. And I think uh, Dennis has set out the, the, the way that in 10E we have some stronger decision making, uh, uh, for instance. All this is extremely contentious and that leads me also to, to Lisa's comment, why don't we go and immediately have regional groups with the energy community. Um, member states are extremely sensitive as to any transfer of competences from national regulators or national ministries uh, to a regional or even central body. And we will see, I mean, I've enthusiastically presented what we propose in the security of supply regulation, but we see already that the idea of regional cooperation is the one where member states currently, some member states at least, are still very skeptical. And it will be a, an uphill fight to get only within the member states this regional concept through. Um, we hope it will be the case, and we hope indeed that we can organize then something very quickly uh, uh, together with the energy community. But that's the state of play, the submission of the proposal is where it is, that's what we hope we can reach, uh, and we need your active uh, uh, um, uh, also support in this discussion, because don't underestimate the resistance we are facing when it comes to solidarity, when it comes to organizing central functions to say, yes, we see, indeed, we need more coordination, but member states have to give it to us. We cannot just say we take it. We have to have a legal act that is adopted by a majority of member states, and un if we don't convince them, they won't give it to us. So that's the interesting work of the next month and we hope very much for the support. And then we will have a meaningful ASA improvement, a meaningful NCE improvement and a meaningful regional cooperation. Without the support, it just won't happen. Thanks. Okay, I, I think we had one more short question here in the front. It's correct, yes? No? The second, second row, yes? Very brief. Very brief. And the answers too. Thank you very much. First of all, let me introduce myself. My name is Milan Roman. I'm the lawyer at the Slovak TSO for electricity. And at the same time, I'm the chairman of a legal and regulatory group of, of NSOE, EGOs for electricity. My question is very brief. When we go for regional approach, and that goes at the uh, panel, and at the same time uh, for the plenum as well, how to tackle the civil law liability? That's all, thank you. The question was? How to tackle the civil law liability issue when we go regional to the commission? I mean, first, very easy. This is nothing new. If you know how market coupling works, all the algorithms, all the, the, the computer is developed within a region. They have to agree with majority of TSOs. So TSOs can be overruled. Uh, um, and, and then the uh, algorithm will be agreed that is agreed by the majority of regions and regional NRAs. It's nothing new. You can apply the, exactly the same uh, uh, model to uh, security of supply or system operation if you wish. D 
dispatching rules. This is already in the CACAM regulation for the, for the experts, so we have already a step there. This is nothing new. I fully agree that in national legislation, um, and that's where TSOs are very afraid, they say, oh, we, we can be made liable. It can cost us billions in some uh, cases if we cause a blackout uh, uh, and we cannot say, yeah, we couldn't steer it because our neighbor has fiddled with the system. It's not our fault. We were overruled in a committee. Um, and I accept, indeed, if we go for regional approach in more security of supply relevant issues, we should clarify immediately that the liability, uh, civil liability and the liability issues should also be organized in a regional manner and that you should not then in an isolated manner be held liable. But very important, security of supply responsibility is not a national one. It is also a national one, but you have a duty, and we saw it in gas. You cannot just say, yeah, I've done my, my best, but uh, whether gas flows or not, I didn't look at my neighbor. You have a duty to cooperate with your neighbor, especially under European law, so it's a shared responsibility in a region and a, a national responsibility, and we have to organize it just uh, in a shared manner, and I agree with you, we need to clarify this if there's a problem with civil liability, but I'm sure Mr. Raleigh has already a team on it uh, and give us some nice uh, proposals for a legal solution. Thanks. Yes, um, if you agree, we can skip the lunch and we continue our discussion. <laughs> I still see some hands up, uh, but I think this, yeah, this will be the last question. Um, lady from uh, Georgia in the center. So, um, my name is Tamar Tsutsumia. I represent the Ministry of Energy of Georgia. I have a question to Mr. Cook regarding the solidarity um, issue uh, in uh, relation to security of supply. This, the issue which is actively discussed within the framework of energy community. And in case the reciprocity clause is adopted within the treaty, what kind of approach can be developed in relation to, and where is the practice in relation to isolated market as uh, energy market, as Georgia is becoming a contracting party of the energy community, and this will mean that uh, the um, EU member states also will have a legal obligation to bring a gas to Georgia as well. So what kind of approach can be developed and is the practice basically within the framework of the European Union in relation to isolated markets? Thank you. Yeah, I mean, isolated, first our question is uh, what obligations do EU members have under EU law uh, uh, with respect to third countries? There we need just to agree. So every member state has to agree that he takes an obligation vis-a-vis -vis a third country, because that's not naturally in the EU. The EU, tre EU treaty is about cooperation between member states and not cooperation with, with third countries. If they agree uh, to a clause, for instance, to start coordinating their plans with a neighbor, um, that has directly uh, uh, direct effects that would make it possible for you to sit on a table in a, in a planning mode, which would already, in our view, bring a lot of benefits. That's, that's a step. And uh, uh, then we have all the other transparency rules, uh, reverse flow rules, and maybe the most uh, harmful or, or sensitive from member states' uh, point of view is indeed then sharing and shipping physically gas to somebody who needs it more than yourself. Again, conceptually it is perfectly possible to apply this also to the whole of the energy community. Whether we will land there, I cannot guarantee you. That very much will depend whether our proposal will survive in the Council and in the Parliament, uh, but legally it's perfectly possible that indeed we apply a rule that will just legally implement what happened with Ukraine. If we see there's a country that it desperately need in need of, of gas, then we try to arrange a sharing and ship gas to this country. Uh, in the Ukrainian case it was not a legal obligation, it was a political commitment, but as we've seen, uh, a, a legal framework is much safer uh, uh, that we have actually results than just uh, uh, trusting in, in political goodwill in certain solutions. There, so the potential is there, that there are benefits, uh, um, but I cannot guarantee you what level uh, of cooperation we will reach with energy community and future energy community uh, uh, contracting parties. Uh, Mr. Mitchek, you still wanted to uh, react yeah. on the solidarity. Thank issues. you. I, I wanted to, to add something to Oliver's uh, 
um, statement uh, and uh, that's practical experience from my side from 2009 and uh, that maybe also could help uh, when I see the results uh, of, uh, of the stress test we will know. In 2009 when we had the crisis uh, OMV uh, was very flexible uh, and uh, provided a natural gas to uh, Slovakia, Slovenia, Hungary, Serbia in reverse flow at the times when reverse flow was not in everybody's mind at that time. Uh, we did that overnight without contracts. Uh, contracts were built afterwards uh, with good experience with our neighbors. So you're right, solidarity works at certain points. What we need for that is uh, tools like, uh, like a hub uh, because we did all these transactions via the Central European Gas Hub. And uh, what we also need, and that's important, also seeing the results of the stress test, is that we need a uh, strong pipeline and connections in Southeast Europe uh, and to link it to, to the Central European Gas Hub because then we can roll out uh, these uh, hub services to the Southeast. And uh, I think that could also then enhance solidarity, even on a voluntary basis. Okay, then. Thanks a lot to everybody. Um, I think we can all agree that we need to improve our cooperation in Europe and the cooperation between Europe and its uh, partners and to strengthen the external dimension of the energy union. I think that's a, it's a big project. I want to conclude with a quote from Marc Aurel, Roman Emperor, who said, what is not good for the swarm is not good for the bee. Let's keep this in mind. And I wish you a nice day, uh, a nice day here in Vienna, and hope to see you next year at the much larger conference. Thank you.